In this video, I'll show you how I made this ice golem here. It's very much a breakdown video, showing my workflow and explaining a few different things with tips and tricks. So it's suitable for all levels, beginners to advanced, but it's not a detailed tutorial. I'll be putting links in the description to the detailed tutorials of the different aspects that I go through. If you like what I do, then do check out the other playlists on this channel and my website for lots of in-depth tutorials and other great content. This video is made possible by the sponsors of this channel, Nvidia and PC Specialist. Here's rendering with just the CPU alone and with the basic denoise. And this is a powerful CPU, but you can see how much it's struggling. And if I change that across to the GPU, you can see the huge difference it makes. It means I can make changes, pose my model, play with the lighting, and in the end, produce better quality and faster renders. PC Specialist are an NVIDIA Studio partner and leading system builders, selling a range of customizable PCs that perform amazingly with Blender. They specialize in custom PCs and laptops for creators and gamers. So configure your next NVIDIA RTX system using PC Specialist online configurator today. So here we have the finished model, and this is rendering in cycles, which really shows the amazing advancements that Blender has made. Obviously that combined with a nice RTX card with the optics denoising. The fact that I can see this in cycles in almost real time is just incredible. This is a glass material, so it's got caustics on. I've got emissions shining through it, and you can see some of the impact of that as it reflects off the glass. And you can see this is still fairly high poly. I was being a little bit lazy and didn't remesh and bake the materials and things. I've got an EV setup as well. It's not quite as good. You obviously have to fake the lights with EV, but you can see the animation in kind of real time. Obviously it stutters a bit, but it's pretty impressive stuff. I'll turn the overlays off so you can see a bit easier. And there it is with the overlays off in cycles. And you can see that light sort of refracting through the different glass. So to show you a bit more, I'll go to solid mode. And you can see the different objects here because I've got the color type set to random. I'll turn my overlays back on and you can see that I've kept these objects separate. It makes it a lot easier when you're weight painting and rigging. I've joined the big areas together like the body and the feet or the lower leg and all the head shape. But keeping that separate, if I go to pose mode now and start moving it about, you can see that it was really easy for me to weight paint and keep that separate from the main body and therefore I don't have this mesh moving with this bone over here. And I could have been even more precise with my weight painting, but you can see the movement's quite nice really. Obviously there's going to be overlap when it squishes right together, but even that overlap isn't too bad. It seems to work quite well. That's a technique often used in games. They have sort of separate objects. So you might have a piece of armor over the top here where the arm kind of links into. And again, it makes it much easier for rigging and animating. So let's take a look at the process of making this model. So obviously you start by getting lots of references and ideas from the internet, Pinterest, places like that. Then I draw out some basic shapes and you can see the designs here. Just a few different shapes and styles, different leg lengths, different sort of roundness and shapes, just to see what it might end up looking like. Once I've got one that I'm happy with, then I trace the outline of that so it's a bit more clear and detailed. It's still very rough and it shows how rough you can be when you're setting up these reference images. As long as it's something you can easily copy over, then it's no problem. I'm using Photoshop, but you can just as easily use Critter, and I use the guidelines to line up the side view and the front view. I also set up the arm as a separate image so I could hide it nice and easily in the viewport so it doesn't get in the way. Then I bring these into Blender and I start making a simple crystal. I only make two of these crystals and use them a bit like Lego bricks to build the character. I make a basic crystal shape and I use the scrape brush in sculpt mode to scrape out the edges. To start with, I use the basic settings of the scrape brush and then I use it with the normal and plain turned on in the advanced settings. That's much better for hard surface modeling and a very sharp edge. But it can be a little bit slower when you're trying to scrape out certain areas and you keep having to go over the same area. I also use the line project tool which actually slices sections off. I'll do another video about that because I think it's a really useful tool for this type of sculpting. So look out for that, links in the description. So I build these two shapes, one kind of long and thin, one more square and rounded. I then use these two blocks to build up the character and you can see I'm just blocking it out here, looking at side and front view and duplicating them, moving them about and pushing them into position. I only do one side to start with. Obviously I'm going to mirror it across the other side later on. Be careful if you're a beginner, make sure you're looking at side view and you give it some sort of curve of a shape. Lots of beginners end up with very flat characters. I do sculpt some of the shapes, so pull them around with the grab brush just so they conform to my reference image. And I tidy the whole thing up later on with the scrape brush. I should have remeshed the original so it was a little bit lower poly because this is extremely high poly at this point. So those with slower machines then do bear that in mind. In reality, it probably didn't need to be as high poly as it is, 
However, the more faces, the sharper those edges are going to look and it does look a little bit cleaner. I use the same technique for the hand and the fingers. It's fairly straightforward and it's a nice simple way of doing a hand. Of course, this character only has three fingers. That's really normal for ice golems. In fact, that's the case for most stylized characters because no one wants to animate fingers. At this point, you should start being able to see your shape a little bit more and therefore maybe move away from your reference image if you feel you need to. And you can see me joining this body mesh together. Now I can start thinking about the mirroring to the other side. There's obviously a bit of tidy up to do along the middle. And I did find I lost a little bit of detail when I started to remesh the shape. This is when I started to think about opening up a cavity in the middle. So I used a Boolean object to cut a hole in my mesh. And then I used the clay strips to kind of fill it out. And again, the scrape brush to scrape off the edges. It was a little bit untidy, but it seemed to just about work in the end. The clay strips brush is quite nice with the scrape brush. You can fill in those areas where there's divots and crevices and then scrape them away with the scrape brush afterwards. Holding down control with the scrape brush, you can actually lift surfaces out, so lift crevices out from areas, and that can be quite helpful as well, but it is a little bit tricky to control. And once again, I grab one of my original crystals and duplicate it to make this sort of area or cage around this life crystal that's inside my golem. That was kind of my story element to this character. So obviously it's got this life force that's emanating from in the middle and maybe that's a weakness in some way. So if this was a game character, then that'd be a good sort of area for the player to be targeting. At this point, it got quite finicky and tricky to work with. After remeshing these into the main model, I tried to sort of smarten them up and tidy them up because obviously they have to have a mirror because it makes it much easier for animating, rigging and so forth but the scrape brush can be really awkward when you're trying to get into those tight areas. If I were to do this again, I probably would have kept it asymmetrical and not worried too much about tidying up because when the final render came, it wasn't particularly noticeable that the areas of overlap in the model. In the forearm here, you can see I had to sculpt it to fit the shape of the forearm. So I had to do a bit more sort of tidy up and that's where I used the clay strips with the scrape brush to fill in areas and then scrape them back again. The character was looking quite spiky, so I thought some spikes for kind of hair would make sense, and it seemed to work out okay. And the head is the other area that needed a fair bit of sculpting to shape it, but it was just a case of using the grab brush to modify the shape, and then generally the clay strips to strip areas out, and then the scrape brush to scrape them back again. I left a cavity for the eyes because I'll have a separate shape in there with an emission on. So there was nothing too complicated here. And there you can see the final sort of sculpted model. It's all joined together. And you can see when I put the random on, you can see the different areas. And I start to think about the shading. Now it might seem a bit early to think about shading before remeshing and things like that. But I wanted to get a rough idea of whether things were working or whether I had to re-sculpt any areas or make any major changes. So I thought putting some basic materials on, thinking about how the lighting was gonna work would be wise before moving further. I thought also it might be useful for you to see some of my experiments, thinking about putting a light inside some of the glass and so forth. Here I was experimenting with the ambient occlusion and giving it an emission, which kind of works and it could be a different monster or a level boss or something. Throughout this, I'm having to work in cycles because Eevee doesn't render glass particularly well, which is why I'm so glad of the advancements being made in Blender and obviously the RTX card. I'll quickly talk you through the shader that I use for the glass. It looks fairly complicated, but it's actually fairly straightforward if you know a little bit about nodes. Check out my node school videos if you're unsure. So if I go to the very top, you can see I'm using the pointiness attribute. That really only works on high poly meshes. If you started with a high poly mesh, then you usually bake this, but like I say, I was being a little bit lazy. I'll show you what that looks like on the model if I press Control Shift, left click on this with the Node Wrangler installed. You can see that I've got the extremities of the mesh, so the pointy bits along to this side of the color ramp, so those white bits that you can see there. And then the darker bits are in purple. So you've got a bit of purple color coming through. That's mixed as an overlay to this texture here, which is just an icy texture that you can see there. And when they mix together, they create this. So that's the basic color. That goes into a color ramp for the roughness. I'll just show you what the roughness looks like. So black being very shiny and white being very rough. Generally, I kept it fairly shiny. So my color ramp is relatively dark. This color also goes into this overlay here which I was just using to mix with this color so I could kind of play with the shadows and the highlights a little bit. But this doesn't do an awful lot, to be honest. And you probably wouldn't notice if this was cut out. I also use this mix RGB here and plug it into a basic bump. So we end up with a bit of bumpiness. And you can see if I go in close, you can see the bumpiness 
mainly from the ice texture that I'm using. And I combine that with a simple noise texture, just like this, to add a bit more variation to the mesh, coming out with this sort of bump, and it breaks up the sharpness of my blocks. Again, a lot of that isn't particularly necessary, it just depends on the type of ice you're after. The whole thing giving this result here, I'll talk about this in a second, but a lot of it also is to do with the lighting setup. So I've got a fair few lights around, which kind of make it sparkle in a way. And with glass, it's just as much about the lighting and reflections as it is the material itself. I'll explain what I was doing up here. As I said earlier, I was using the ambient occlusion node and experimenting with that. If I hook that up, you can see the results. So that's the ambient occlusion into a color ramp, and that's using that as a mix shader between our main shader and an emission. And I can obviously bring up the amount and influence of this ambient occlusion emission here, or bring it down there, which is an interesting effect, but I didn't really like how it was working out. Hopefully that gives you enough details of the textures. I always want to pose my models, so I give it a basic rigify rig. It was only at the very end that I decided to animate because I fancied a bit of fun doing that. I cheated a bit because I just put the fourth and third finger together. I think you can delete the fourth finger, but sometimes when you delete things on the rigify rig, it can be a real pain and your generated rig just doesn't work. That's definitely something I need to get back to. Todd or Nikolov did a wonderful course on using rigify, link in description. And that's mainly who I've learned most of my Rigify knowledge from. Before joining the mesh to the rig, I did decimate each of the areas. The decimate modifier is really good because it decimates it but keeps its shape, unlike the remesh, which is also really good in other ways. But it is still a very high poly mesh, which it doesn't need to be. But doing that did save me a lot of work. As I mentioned earlier, the weight painting was really easy because I could choose a bone and just attach that whole object to that bone. So it was nice and simple. And it was at this point I remembered to turn Auto Normalize on, which is just here. And that's meant to be that you can only paint for that one bone and it will get rid of any influences from other bones. But it doesn't seem to always work out like that. And at this point I started to pose the model and then thought, actually I'll animate it. So we ended up with this. And there we have it, another fun project. In total they take me about three days, but obviously that's on and off working on them. So it'd probably be a busy day's work. Let me know what you think or if you have any questions, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.